Okay. Some of these pictures I'm hoping predate you guys. You were not around here when they were doing that. Yeah, really. Well, you all remember that. And you were probably too young for this. Where is that house? I'm not too sure, but the 38 Howard came. Were you around for that? I uh, know, I don't think so. <laughs> that looked like Martin's lawn. It was. Excuse me, I don't know why this this, this family. It is swing around again. Oh, all right. Plain. Were you related to the? Plain this is family? across the street. No. And again, this predates you. I was showing old. Oh! How many times she yelled at me? <laughs> And there's my mom. Your mother. Oh my God, I remember that. Yeah. I remember the first time I came there while he played cards with the guy. Right, upstairs. Yeah, I got a picture of that. Yeah. I can't remember Julian, but it was beaten up at the club. In the fire station? Yep. <laughs> I can tell by the attire what year it is. <laughs> well, I think they were around to about 1910 or something around then, wasn't That's it? That's around the 1890, 1898, something around there. Who's in there? Is that a Oh, yeah, it's going around again, huh? Yeah. You want to go around again? Or do you? Or do uh, yeah, it wouldn't be fast. It's a little slower now. Yeah. Okay. Johnny. <laughs>
either free or half price. And the same thing for the milk. I remember um, later on um, when they made bread, I think that was more popular than the lunches <laughs> because it was nice and fresh. It was fresh butter and it was about two cents each. But uh, in 53, uh, there were about, um, now my statistics here, I had some of the, oh, the, uh, we had about 4,400 4, people in 53 in operating. Uh, and a couple of years later, it was up to 6,000. And of course, now we're at 15,000. So we had a lot of rapid growth between 53 and uh, the early 60s. Uh, and of course, one of the first things I remembered was the uh, anniversary, uh, 100th anniversary for North Reading. That was in 1953. And uh, as a kid, I remember going down to the bonfire and everything covered in uh, the, bun the centennial bunting. So that was, that was good. Um, and, and just to remind everybody, uh, and the history, uh, looks like everybody knows the history, especially those in this society. But uh, North Reading uh, was incorporated in 53. Before that, we were part of Reading. Uh, and Reading had broken off from Lynn around 1640, I think. 1644. And uh, later on, South Reading broke off. There was uh, Wakefield followed and uh, preceded that by uh, Wilmington, I think, in the 1700s. But, uh, and when I was a kid, uh, the thing I remember was the center of town was the, here at the Flint, uh, Flint Hall and then by Jones Brothers. The Jones Brothers was the shopping center. It had the, uh, the grocery store. The second the section of it, run by the other brother, was the hardware. And to the left of it, where the hornet's nest is now, was the post office. And uh, later on, the post office moved down to Bow Street, but that's what I, that was what was there then. And uh, later on, they put a bank in where the uh, dry cleaning place is now. I remember I got into trouble uh, with some of the local proprietors there in the bank because for a while I was trying to collect coins and I had this idea I could collect a lot of different coins by going to the bank, cashing in five dollars, get all the coins, take it to the Drexel Drex store that was later moved in to where the post office was, change it there, then go down the Ryers, change it there. And I tried the circuit again, but they caught on pretty quickly. <laughs> that did not work out too well. Well, it worked out well for a while. <laughs> but uh, the thing I remember about the town hall is, I think some of you might remember, um, everything was here. The police station was to the left, but I believe that was, it was there then. And then if you went up the front steps, there was a corridor that had the library on the right hand side and town offices on buildings off of that uh, on rooms off of that main hall yeah. and we would go up if there was a town meeting or an event would go up to the second floor where the stage was the auditorium and uh, that was where all the activity was now it's all at the school if you want to go to uh, town meetings or plays or whatever it's, it's always been the schools once that got built. But uh, that was, even the, um, back in the 50s, some of the uh, other buildings were used as schools, <laughs> school rooms. I remember at one point, uh, certainly the band, and I don't know if other buildings, other rooms were used for other purposes, but we would have our band practice over at the uh, town hall second floor. <laughs> Uh, and there was another, the senior center now, I had classes in there also, I don't know if it was just one or two classrooms, but we would have classes there back in 19, uh, oh, I think it was 56, that was when the town was just starting to build the, uh, the, high, the high school, and uh, they didn't have enough rooms for all, this, all of the students. So we'd, we'd use the other buildings in town. 
And um, uh, okay. well, um, the other re events that I remember, uh, I mentioned how the Toe Post Office used to be at the um, uh, where Hornet's Nest is now. And, but when the post office moved up, that's when Rexall Drug had moved in. Later on, they moved down to the area where the Abbott Shoe used to be. For those who didn't know it or forgot about it, the Abbott Shoe, I think, pretty much was the only thing that occupied that land down there. Mm -hmm. uh, but also down there, that was where the river took a turn, the Ipswich. And as a kid, we would go down to that area. There was a dirt road, as I remember, along, along the Ipswich. And we, as kids, would go down that dirt road in the summertime. People didn't have many pools then, if any. And we'd go swimming in the river. And it was interesting that uh, you always had to watch out when you were swimming in the river, either there or, I guess, others would swim down by uh, Central, uh, Central Street. Mm -hmm. But uh, you always had to check yourself for unattended uh, or mm -hmm. un little friends that decided to attach to you. <laughs> and we'd be pulling off those leeches <laughs> for a couple of minutes and checking each other out. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, shopping was another interesting thing. I mentioned the Jones Brothers. But the other thing I remember as a kid, there was a lot of dependence upon delivery services, which I, I think it must be because there were not enough cars for in people's households. They might have had one. And to get the shopping done or to take care of kids, you depended upon services. I think everybody, and they, many people still do, get milk delivered. But um, we also used to have uh, Cushman's Bakery would deliver Breads and other product. Uh, I remember Jack Ellis uh, used to have a fish truck came by. I think we always had him come over on either Fridays or so, and we'll be having fish for the, that night. And um, the, my sister reminded me of Atkinson's um, grocery service, and I hadn't realized how I'm talking this evening with with some of the other people here that. They remembered Atkinson's that it was a grocery store, but they had the delivery service, and they would come up with their truck and open up their their awning, and you would pick out your groceries. And I guess you might have pre-ordered them, but um, that service was around also. Those have gone by. And this is the last thing I'll mention was the, was the phone service. I re faintly remember having the crank phone by our door that going outside to the to a driveway and faintly remember I don't know when it actually went out and we picked up the party lines. But uh before that um, I believe that happened around our early fifties, maybe fifty two. And then we had the party lines and most people remember how the party lines were there was not too much privacy for the <laughs> six or seven years that that might have been around because you'd, you'd use the phone and uh, you didn't know who was listening on. But son, I think I'm sure the kids, I don't know if adults got it, but we'd heard of some a ring, maybe one or two rings, and one of them was ours and one of them was the other ones. And, we might, for entertainment, pick up and listen. <laughs> and, and I think people have learned how to hear these for breathing and <laughs> someone listening on us. But, um, the, uh, oh, the, the one other thing was the uh, with TVs. They're so prevalent now, and we're so used to them. But right around the 50s, they there were very few around. I, I remember the one in our neighborhood, which was probably up on Chestnut, and I'm down on Flint. But uh, my sister and I, probably when we were about eight years old or so, would travel up to the top of the street, go to the neighbor's house every Friday evening, and watch the Long Ranger. Oh. But you're watching it on a 10-inch screen, black and white. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
and one of the things that was interesting when I realized that that TV actually had been invented much sooner. Mm -hmm. But I guess it was because of one, the economics and the time. A lot of developments in TV and probably <laughs> phones and other things were known about for 10, 20 years. I think TVs were actually invented in the 30s, mm -hmm. even color ones. But um, things had not progressed far enough to make them inexpensive enough to use or good enough to use. But it was quite a while, uh, they, in a short time, they developed, rapidly developed. And uh, I suspect that's because of uh, all of a sudden the marketing was there and they were part of the World War II. Yeah. 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 That yeah. stopped everything. Everybody <coughs> went to war rapid. Oh, right. right. So, right. Or secrecy. Yeah. Yeah. So, but uh, it, I think that's why we saw so much development during that decade in the 50s to, to the 60s because so many things have been developed and all of a sudden the, the spigot opened up and they all came out. But other things still seem to come fast. Well, that'll be, I'll give it over to who, whoever. whoever.
Water skiing, sailing, swimming, beating up the boys on the raft. <laughs> I, I was the little bully. Um, and uh, teachers that I remember that had an impact on me, I, I have to say that Fred Keyes had a, a very large impact on me. And um, when I was a senior in high school, standing at my locker, he was the one that came out and said to me, President Kennedy's been shot. And uh, I always remember him for the way he said it. Um, but he taught us a lot about life in his class. I didn't read, I was not well read, let's put it that way. But I learned a lot about what he called booze butts and babes. That was, that, that was uh, what he taught in class. <laughs> Who's butts and babes? Um, Vicki and I graduated in 1964. We were cheerleaders together. We were in the original installation of the Rainbow Girls here in North Reading when we were in the seventh grade. Um, oh, yes, that's what Richard reminded me of. Uh, I think we were about 11 years old. And um, this uh, Catholic Church had uh, minstrel shows every year. And uh, Vicki and myself and another friend of ours, Diane Campbell, we did a tap dance to Peggy O'Neill. And it was up, I remember the stage and everything, and I remember Lorraine, somebody singing a Lorraine LeBlanc. Lorraine LeBlanc. She and I used to sing together. Yeah, she sang Mr. Wonderful. And um, then after that, we used to use that facility for teen dances until finally, canteen from, from school, until finally we moved to the second floor of the Grange Hall and we went to dances there. Anybody remember that? Yeah? You do? Yeah. Okay. Average dogs in this orchestra. Oh, I don't remember an orchestra. No, this, this oh, before me? The second floor that that was before me, huh? It was a, she played the piano, he played the drums, and they <laughs> called it an orchestra. <laughs> um, when I when I was younger, um, most of my time was spent in athletics. Um, you know, we did cheerleading. Um, I was captain of the track team, uh, captain of the gymnastics team. I didn't know a thing about theater or singing or anything like that. You know, they, those were all the well-educated of my class, and uh, we were the athletes, the people that I hung around with. And it was a great time. Um, yeah, fun and mischief. I never got into mischief. <laughs> I didn't. The only time I got into mischief was when I took typing class, and the teacher said, you have to cut your fingernails. I said, no, I don't. I can type very well. You know, I was a very good typist. No, I'm sorry, you have to cut your fingernails. So we sent me to the principal's office. I got thrown out of class. And guess what I did in the principal's office? I typed, I typed for him. Um, I remember um, you were talking about televisions. And I felt very lucky because uh, we moved here from Chelsea, by the way. And um, I remember when I was quite little, we had a television. I felt very privileged. And um, watching the Mickey Mouse Club. Club. And Spin and Marty. Yep. Yep. Having a crush on Tim Considine. Um, I went to the Shirtless School back in, in Chelsea. And I have a lot of fond memories back there. Anybody from Chelsea? I went to the Shirtless School. Did you? Oh, my goodness. And it's still there. Uh, no. Yeah, Is it's it still, still there? Yeah. Do you know the Carter School? That burned down. Oh, no, I didn't know the Carter School. That was probably in another section of Chelsea. Yeah. Yeah. All my relatives was from Chelsea. My great, aunt, my great aunts lived there until they were over 100. And uh, we went to St. Luke's Church. And, yeah. yeah. And I used to go to the YWHA with my Jewish friend. You know, because that was more fun. Um, Special memories. God, I have so many memories in North Reading. Um, 
I guess when it was safe enough for Vicki and I to walk all the way home from school and our parents never worried about it. Um, and it used to take us, you know, dawdling along down Central Street and all the way over to the pond. It would take us a couple of hours. <laughs> One rainstorm I had on a quilted skirt. Well, needless to say, it was a little heavy walking home that day. <laughs> and um, uh, we used to go to the Bunker Hill parades. We did so much together. Yeah. And I practically lived at the Johnson House, where Vicki is now. Um, oh, living in North Reading. I think uh, living in North Reading, how it shaped me was um, innocence. I still have a little of that, even though I've been around the block a few times, been around the country, in every state but about 10. Um, it, there's a sense of innocence growing up here, and it was at a, it was at a wonderful time, you know, before any of the drugs came in, or, I mean, I don't think I had a beer till I was a sophomore in college, you know. Uh, and there's a lot of that that happens now, and I, I feel sorry because the kids aren't enjoying their childhood. We enjoyed our childhood very much, very much so. And especially all of the sports activities growing up on the pond. And um, I practically lived at the school with all my sports activities. Um, where I used to live on Bachelor Ave, um, there was an area there, and they don't call it that anymore. It was called Holtz Grove. And we were talking about Holtz Grove. And the ice house was there. And someone has made up some, some kind of a picture or something that's in Clark Park of what it was like over at the ice house. And they have it in the wrong place. But we used to play baseball out there. We used to play football. And um, we, we had a really good time. It was a wonderful childhood. I, I just can't say enough about it. And it prepared me, it really did prepare me for life, you know. And, and uh, of course, I never went to the Congo Church until about 25 years ago. And now, now they are my family. And, and I love everybody there. Thanks. You ready, Ben? Oh, and some of you may have known my dad, Charlie Denning. He ran for Selectman. And he owned Denning and Piercy Heating and Air Conditioning. And it's gone now. And Eddie Piercy, that a lot of you may know, his daughter is sitting here. Um, Eddie Piercy tells everybody, I knew her before she was born. <laughs> I was at her first birthday party. Because Eddie and my dad worked together at H.P. Hood. And they both retired and opened their business here in North Reading. And the reason we moved to North Reading is because Eddie was here first. So that was a gift. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I, I've changed the whole, uh, whatever I said I was going to say, Julie, I'm not doing anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> what else is new? Just, just quickly, a background, we did move here in 1945, right after the war. In uh, um, October of 1945, I was in the sixth grade. And uh, our first ride out to North Reading, from, we live in Stone, right in the Stone and Marrow's line. And I was just when I said, where the hell are we going? <laughs> it seemed like we were driving forever. You know, and all we were doing is coming up Havel Street, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But uh, it was a good move by us. And when we finally decided, uh, after we, I graduated from college, and Judy and I had gotten married right out of college, and we'd already had kids, and we came home, and where are we going to live? And we looked all around and Judy said, I want to stay in North Reading. She's from Marblehead. Marbleheaders don't very often say they want to stay in North Reading. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. So, a, a few things you said here, I, I've got all kinds of notes from what has already been said here. Uh, first of all, Fred Keyes was my best friend. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, he was, we were very, very close. We ran for selectmen together. Mm -hmm. um, we did not run as a team. In fact, we didn't know each other. 
we just got to know each other when we ran for selectman, and that was in uh, I remember that. 1966. Yep. Yeah. I remember that uh, because I was 33 years old. 33 times 2 is 66. <laughs> That's how I think. But I wrote down little uh, notes here about uh, different things that I remember. I can remember going down to Jones's to watch, I believe it was the Joe Lewis, Billy Kahn fight. Dave, Dave might correct me on that. But it was watching the, the TV in the Jones Brothers uh, window. They had the, the TV in the window so that you could watch and That was about the only TV we know about back then. And that was, I don't know when it was, it must have been right after, uh, you know, and it had to be, if we moved here in uh, 1957, it had to be 57. Oh, and another thing I can tell you about. We didn't move here in 1957. Yeah. Boy. Oh, oh. Right. After we were married, you watched it in the Jones Brothers' window? Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> well, I'm glad you hear, June. <laughs> 1945. Yeah, 1940. Oh, jeez. Okay. Thank God you're coaching yeah. him. <laughs> Um, I had some other things. Now I have to tell you about the, uh, the funniest story I have about myself. Who was the, uh, now I know who it was. Um, <clears throat> someone had called up the uh, North Reading Police Department. And I used to go up there uh, in Parapaka Forest and change my clothes and get dressed in my running stuff and then run through the park, the, the forest. So I'm, that, that's the background. Meantime, someone had uh, talked about a, uh, no, this has to, i got to tell you this later. So I'm going out and I'm riding, it's getting a little bit dark, and um, you know, I'm jogging along, coming, right and coming back, and then coming down. As I'm coming down that last hill, I'm going over the, the hill, and this was 1966, I, can, I know that. And um, I can see some lights, some flashing lights and so forth, and this and the other thing. And I say, what the hell's going on down there? And then I can see there's a police car there. And then I can see there's two police cars there. <laughs> and I hear this voice, who's there? And I said, it's Ben, Ben Sands. Who are you? And he said, it's Gus Lamont, and he was a sergeant in the police department at that point. And he said, we've had reports of a streaker. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God, had to, be the woman, had to be the woman across the street in a little ranch house over there. And he was so, I was a selectman, I had just been elected a selectman. <laughs> and he was scared to death, you know. Well, the Gus was. Police called in your car number. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Right. Yeah, so they had my uh, license number, and they knew that was my car. So go, driving up there, they're saying, we're going to catch this streaker up there. <laughs> but unfortunately, I think it's one of our town selectmen. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that, was, that was that. Uh, something else that actually just happened uh, to me a little while ago. Um, I had a, uh, a letter from anyone remember, I'm sure some people would, Shirley Washburn, she lived up on Looney Hill, and, yeah, yeah, right, right, and uh, she was, she was a, a great gal, and, and very, very active, and has uh, had, a, had a great life, lives up in uh, um, New Brunswick, I think, in the, in the summers, in, in Florida, in the winters. And she sent me a picture, and I don't know why she saved it, but it was a picture of my father receiving the first phone call made in North Reading. Wow. When my father, well that had to be 68, because he would have been chairman of, no, uh, no, 50, excuse me, 50, uh, 
Yeah, you know, 56, yeah, 55 or 56. Um, because I was in the Marine Corps at that point. And uh, he, he and, and she had this great picture and an article and so forth about the first phone call being made. And then there was another picture and it had uh, oh, Hud Rogers and a couple of other guys standing there and they were uh, receiving the phone call. And uh, the pictures were taken on the uh, where the call was made and where the call was received. And they're just standing there in a suit and so forth. So that that that, that was very nice of her to send that. And I don't know where she where she got it in the first place. How am I going to use my classes here? When I moved to North Reading, my my best friend was, and I mentioned this before, was Joe Fermini, and some of you were there a couple of years ago, and I spoke I spoke all about Joe Fermini and what a great person he was and the things that he's done. And when Joe well, what did Joe say when when uh, I moved into town? Joe said life began when you moved across the street. Yeah. And, because there weren't that many kids in North Reading. Yeah. And particularly <laughs> so that, didn't have anybody to play with. Yeah, that age and so forth. So Joe and I became uh, best friends. Joe became very famous as a uh, medical person at the uh, uh, NIH and so forth. And, yeah. Has a syndrome named after him and all of this kind of stuff. So he's he's an internationally known. Um, oh, what do you call him? Genetics, right? Yeah, gen and genetic research and uh, so forth. Just uh, a guy that's known throughout the country and uh, overseas and so forth. And has a syndrome named after him and all of that. Um, I, as a sidelight. Um, I was a usher at uh, Dick Ham's wedding, and, Di and Dick was an usher at my wedding. So that goes that goes uh, way back when he would have been married. Uh, I was trying to figure that out. In '49, no. 40, no, no, uh, '53, 1953, yeah. or '52, '53. He was a year older and uh, so forth, and I, hadn't, I was still in college at that point. So that was just a little sideline. Um, we used to go to the Red Sox games all the time. Dave, Dave claims I went to some Red Sox game with him. <laughs> and uh, We used to go in uh, with, with Joe, I remember. We'd go in every Sunday that we could on the 933 train into Boston, just the, and we'd be like 14 years old or 13 years old, and uh, you, know, you know, you wouldn't have your kids walking around in Boston nowadays. Of course, I went to a school where I walked through the woods for about a half a mile when I was in the first grade in Stoneham, and uh, you know, I'm saying, hey, you don't do that anymore around here, or around anywhere, and. Uh, we would go on the 933 train, you'd go to a double header, which would, we'd get there early to get autographs and stuff like that. And then you would, the first part of the double header was uh, obviously one o'clock. You had double headers every Sunday, every week. And uh, then you'd get like the 530 train home after watching the double header. So nowadays, you know, you, you watch a Red Sox game, like tonight if they're playing. You know, those games are three and a half hours, you know. So we were playing games in like an hour and 45 minutes or something like that, and two of them, and getting out of there and on the train at 5.30. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah. absolutely incredible. Now, they might have been, the second game might have been seven innings. Might have been nine innings the first first game, and seven innings the second game. But 9.33 train, uh, every... Every uh, Saturday morning or every Sunday morning that uh, that we could go, uh, I too have re uh, re memories of skating on the pond. You know, I was a hockey player, and he was a hockey player, and I'm sure we spent a lot of time on Martin's Pond. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we really had some 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 good ice up there. Uh, what else do I have that's of any interest? Oh, when we started uh, the hockey team in North Reading, Judy, just wanted to mention that. Didn't have hockey in the high school and so forth. And a bunch of us uh, started it. Uh, Nick Nickerson was one of the one of the guys. Kenny Goddard 
myself and a few other guys. And, uh, the first, and then I got to be the, the coach of the team, the high school team. And uh, uh, my assistant coach was Bobby Coffel, who was uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from the uh, famous Coffel family. On Elm so, Street. Yep, on Elm Street. yep, right on Elm Street. Yep, well, right beside Kenny's house. Yeah. yeah. I ran into that boulder in center field once and just about broke my leg. <laughs> uh, I think that's a, uh, I was a selectman for two terms along with Fred. That's how Fred and I got to know, got to know each other so well. And uh, I could, Judy can remember that I came home after, you know, like our first selectman's meeting after we'd been elected. And uh, I said to Judy, I said, you know that Keys guy, I think I think he and I could be good friends. And she kind of said, you know, you've known him for you know, two hours and you're telling me he's going to be one of your best friends. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened, yeah. He, he became my best friend and uh, we lost him about uh, hmm, four four three or four years ago. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Why yeah. Was five? Five, was it? Yeah. I don't know. We see Franny all the time. We go with her you know, almost every week or so. And his son has the uh, law firm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, well, I can pass it on. I'm still on Elm Street, only on the opposite side. I uh, went to school at the Batch. In fact, in the fifth grade, I went to school right here in the basement of the library. We had a, a class that was, half of the class was uh, the fifth grade, the other half was the sixth. And they finally divided us, so we we came over here. Um, graduated from the batch and went down to Reading like everybody else did. But to back up a little bit, when you were talking about the um, Jones brothers and the post office, yeah. I'm a little bit older than you are, so <laughs> when I was younger, I remember the part on Jones's that was the hardware store. Yes. That was the post office for a little while. They had they had the uh, mailboxes and everything there. Yeah. Then they moved down to where um, I think where the uh, center cut is now in Joe. Because I remember yes. going up, you know. And then down the street, a little further, uh, what used to be Roundtree's Hardware Store years after, that was a little grocery store. It was a little IGA, and it was uh, Mr. Pennell, Al Pennell had it. But I can remember uh, uh, the post office. They used to bring in a mail delivery in the morning. And then they'd bring it again in the evening, and it was by private automobile. It was no mail delivery. It was just somebody would go down to Reading and um, pick it up. Uh, we went on down to Reading, and I graduated from there in uh, 52. And I graduated June 11th, and I got married June 12th. <laughs> That's because my first husband was in the service, was going overseas. I waited till June 12th because it was my birthday and I didn't have to ask my father to sign. Uh. <laughs> so I, uh, uh, my husband went overseas and then uh, we had two children and when my daughter was ten and a half, my son two and a half, he was killed in a car accident. We had just bought the house that we're in now and I said, oh, where do I go from here? But I just kept my head on my shoulders and I had wonderful friends and I had a lot of support behind me and then um, I saw the picture of the not the Starlight Drive-In Theater, and I used to work there part time, and that's where I met my husband. He was my boss, you know. As I say, he was. <laughs> he was. He came in as the the manager of the drive-in and uh, worked there uh, a couple of years, and then he left. And then, like six years later, we got married, and was still in the house that I was in, bought in 1964. A lot of changes on Elm Street. The houses that are there now, you know, weren't there. Just the old, you know, like Turner Farm, Wheeler Farm, and so forth. And um, it's all farms, I, right? It's all farms down there. Yeah. yeah. And like you say, um, if your kids went out and walked on the street, you weren't afraid. And my two older sisters and I used to go to Reading at, on a Friday night and go to the theater. And there was the bus used to run from Reading Lane's bus from the depot would come to North Reading back and forth, mm -hmm. and it would go down to Dutton's Corner. And if there was nobody else on the bus, the bus driver would go down with, go down and turn in the cemetery. So we didn't have too far to walk. And um, but never afraid to go out and walk. 
Uh, we used to swim in the Ipswich in the river across the street where they had the double bridge. Yep. Yeah, and um, but I just um, my family grew up and um, I you know worked different places. I retired 12 years ago, but I uh, it's my wonderful friends and. I, I can't leave North Reading because I've made so many friends and even I've gone, we go over to Wilmington to church suppers and the, a retired police chief over there came up when I went into the church one night to the supper and somebody came up and said, for God's sake, do you know everybody? Because he was over in Wilmington, but I have, uh, and I have no desire to leave. The big thing was um, going to school here, I missed the addition or the extension, the batch, because I graduated from the batch in 49. And then um, I graduated from the school in Reading that burnt, and they, you know, they built a new school down there. But it's my, my life has been here, and this is where it's gonna be. It's gonna stay. I'm glad for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I have no desire to leave. A lot of people say, how can you stay someplace all your life? You know, in one town, I said it was very easy. Just look at the stuff I have to pack up to move, and I'm not going to I should make a slight disclaimer. I, um, I am not old, old North Reading. Um, I've always felt, for some reason or other, that I was basically a newcomer. My parents moved here uh, four years before I was born. In, and when they came here in um, 1940. Um, and so that uh, when I started school at the Bachelor, I found that everyone here, so many people had been here for absolutely generation after generation after generation, whether they were Flints or Eatons, or they were, lived over at the pond and they were surrounded by cousins and other relations. And here I was, I felt like an absolute newbie. And, uh, so I, it's, um, it's, it's funny how one's perception is, even though I kind of lived here, my, lived here basically my whole life. I was way up at so far at the end of the, at Havel Street, there were very few kids around my own age. And if I, and I made friends with kids just over the line in Andover. So a number of my playmates uh, in my early years were from Andover, and we would, uh, we would skate on the uh, pond there in Harold Parker Forest and, um, and have little pickup hockey games and other wintertime fun up there. I was thinking back and I was trying to pick a memorable year and it's interesting that everyone seems to pick the same year, 1953, a lot of events happened uh, in, uh, in my life at that time, uh, some both good and some bad, unfortunately. Uh, I had one grandmother who broke her hip that January, and then, the, and then later that summer in, 50, in 53, my other grandmother uh, sadly passed away. But I'm not going to dwell on the unhappy things. I'm going to talk about, we'll talk about getting ready for school. And getting ready for school required a shopping. Well, shopping was um, interesting because in North Reading did not have a lot of large stores. Uh, we've all talked about Jones Brothers, and of course, if you went over the bridge on Washington Street and turn the corner where Nance Cafe was, uh, you would find you would have the Albert uh, McGoldrick Pharmacy. And I'll also tell you a little secret about um, uh, McGoldrick's Pharmacy. He was a very good druggist. I was uh, sick with bronchitis one year, and he, and, uh, he produced uh, six different flavors of cough syrup, each a little package and a little bottle, so I wouldn't get bored with all taking one flavor to, <laughs> to control my uh, bronchitis. At that time, a um, pharmacy could um, sell spirits for medicinal purposes. <laughs> and when I was a little child and I was there with my mother, and it was interesting to see the number of people that would come in and sign a register that they were buying a bottle of wine or whiskey, which he had stored away in the cellar, and would bring up, and you would sign the book, and you would have these um, uh, 
and you would purchase it for medicinal use. <laughs> so it was kind of uh, amusing that we had a little, a little package store here in the center of town in a very unofficial way. Also, when you were, uh, if you were taken ill, we had not a good many doctors in town at that time. Uh, Dr. Hoyt, um, who uh, was a very talented osteopath from, um, came from Kirksville, Missouri, uh, his first office was in the, um, actually in one of the side parlors of the Damon Tavern. Uh, they, uh, he and his wife and his three children were there and they rented half of the Damon Tavern before they um, moved to a house which is now the current Congregational Church Parsonage, and he renovated the um, what is now known at the Congregational Church as the Annex, was his office, and then eventually he built a very modern house across the street, uh, which is now, I think, painted white, and that is next to the old Sewell's house, in between the Sewell's and the Abbott's house. And if you know those um, ancient, uh, designations of houses. But here I was going to get ready for school, and so this required trips to various nearby towns. So we would go to Wakefield, and I would be outfitted at Bowser's. And Bowser's was for men and boys, and I can remember in the mid-1950s, I got an outfit which I thought was absolutely the cat's meow. I, I uh, had picked out a pair of pale blue, kind of almost a robin's egg blue trousers. I had a pink dress shirt and a very narrow slate gray tie. I was absolutely in the latest of fashions. Also, uh, you would go next door to Elite Shoe and you would get your Buster Brown shoes for boys. And you would also, in that shoe store, they did ha have those old-fashioned machines where you could kind of stick your feet in and yeah. get your yeah. feet x-rayed, yeah. 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 uh, which I'm sure yeah. that the OSHA would not approve of today. <laughs> and, uh, but I've never heard anybody getting foot yeah. cancer from our radiation burns, but they certainly were not exactly a good idea. The, um, the other great treat in uh, Wakefield was around the corner, uh, just off Main Street, was a wonderful music store called Melody Ranch. And it has to be one of the largest music stores I've ever been in. I think the only thing that surpassed it was, what was it, uh, um, Tower Records and one of the other stores in Boston. But this had vast quantities of sheet music, 45s, 78s, and if it was a current song or hit, you could get it there at, um, at Melody Ranch. Of course, on Main Street was also a uh, Park Snows, where my mother enjoyed shopping. Mm -hmm. And if we couldn't find things uh, there, sometimes, of course, there were all the stores in Reading, uh, and there was um, the uh, um, Eugene's for men and boys mm -hmm. on Main Street, where sometimes I would help pick out a uh, maybe a flannel shirt for my father for his birthday. And right there on Main Street was also the Woolworths 5 and 10, where I could, had to get every year a new pencil box uh, made out of cardboard and have little drawers so I could be, uh, hold all my favorite pencils. And then um, you would have get other notebooks and other things there, also at M.F. Charles. Then yeah. further down the street, right on the corner of Haven, was a drugstore where my uh, parents first had an account because they lived in Reading for two years uh, before they came to North Reading. At Willis's Drugstore, and then you go around the corner and you would eventually get to Atkinson's. And of course, there was, Atkinson's was really, it was almost something right out of Dickens, um, that uh, the meat department was held by uh, a Mr. Abbott from North Reading and a Mr. Judd from Wakefield, and they wore traditional butcher's garb. In other words, they had uh, uh, white shirts that were rolled up, they still wore a tie, they had big aprons, and they had the traditional butcher's straw hat. 
It looked like they were going to a boating party, but this was the traditional attire which had been popular since the 19th century for a well-established butcher who knew what he was doing. And like everybody else, we had an account at Atkinson's. They had a, a little glass-in office with bookkeepers there to take accounts, and basically everything was charged, and then it would be, your groceries would be uh, picked out, put in huge wooden crates, and then in that little delivery van would arrive in our yard. Um, and so my mother really didn't have to worry about loading groceries into the car. If I was very good, and it was a special treat, we would go across the street to Francis Brothers. Francis Brothers was a kind of a strange store. It had miscellaneous hardware on the first floor. Then you walked up about six steps in the back, and you got to a toy department. And they had all kinds of toys and books. And I think that is where all over the years, all my Hardy Boy books came from Francis Brothers in Reading. I also should mention about the entertainment. Uh, most of the other towns, we had the drive-in, but the indoor movie theaters were all in Wakefield, Reading, Andover, um, and I can remember seeing and uh, going to the uh, my parents and the Andover Playhouse to see numerous movies. Uh, that year, 1953. Uh, was the year that the movie Calamity Jane came out. I saw that with my parents in Wakefield. Uh, and then, uh, at some point, we would actually make a, a big trek up to Lawrence at the grandest of all movie theaters, the Palace. And that is where I saw, also in 1953, the wonderful uh, move, uh, religious movie, The Robe, starring Richard Burton, which was still a great classic. And I saw my first 3D movie. And it was absolutely terrifying. It was called Bawana Devil, and it was about in Kenya, or in, uh, they were in East Africa, they were trying to build a railroad, and they were impeded by progress by a man-eating tiger. And this tiger would jump out at you as you were wearing your 3D, uh, 3D glasses, and you thought this tiger was going to jump into your lap and devour you. Fortunately, it didn't, but, I, uh, but it, was, it was great fun. Of course, um, Lawrence also had another attraction not far from the movie theater and the, and the stores, uh, the Cherry and Webb, the department store where my mother liked to shop. My father loved the big hardware store, um, which was called Treat Hardware. We even got our farm our old cub tractor from them. And there was a little park uh, nearby which had a wonderful stone bridge, which I really wanted to uh, run over and uh, and, and cross, and it also had a wonderful World War I uh, cannon, one of these big guns with its huge wheels, and they are all in, all in, bro all in weathered bronze, which I thought was absolutely a wonderful thing to see. In um, Wakefield, of course, the, I loved, uh, I would beg my mother to stop at the little park there at the end of the lake because I wanted to check out the bandstand and had to run up and run around the, the, little, the little colorful Victorian style bandstand. And these were, these were kind of fun opportunities for outings uh, and adventures in uh, nearby, nearby shopping. The, in 1953, the great event was the uh, centennial of the town with the parade, which just seemed to go on and on and on forever. There was a float with a, a, with, from the Congregational Church, and they had a whole choir singing in it. There were cars that were uh, covered with carnations made out of, of, of a, crepe paper, so they, uh, in various pastel colors, so it looked like it was covered with carnations. And there was uh, the older Mr. Putnam with his red, uh, beat up red tractor dragging a little trailer, and on it was the somewhat bedraggled and unrestored water witch, the, ta the town's first fire engine. And speaking of the fire department, a memorable events were the uh, the annual Firemen's Carnival. These were great because they were held 
they, they use all the grounds of the bachelor school and, of course, before the high school was built, we had the North Reading Park, which also gave an expansive area. They would set up a, a Ferris wheel. They had a merry-go-round, and this was, um, you know, merry-go-round, when, this was when merry-go-rounds were merry-go-rounds. No recorded music. It had a electric-powered uh, little uh, uh, player piano instrument that was a cross between a player piano and a calliope, and the music from this was wonderful. They had a midway, and my favorite game was that they had um, a little game in this thing. They had this huge board that they would spin around, and they would let loose a live mouse, and the little mouse would <laughs> dive down a hole. Now, you've got this card, and the card had four numbers on it, and if the mouse dove down the hole with the right number, and you and you had that winning number on the card, you got a prize. I still have about six Plaster of Paris banks that I won at the Fireman's Carnival as prizes from the mouse game. I became so enamored with the game that I started sending Christmas cards to the lady who ran the mouse game, saying, looking forward to seeing you next, next, next year at the Fireman's Carnival. So I became, and uh, when I, years later, I, uh, when we were at a car uh, carnival, um, a Labor Day carnival up in Maine, I found there was a, uh, it was called Smokey's Great Shows, and they were still had the mouse game. And I did win a prize. Although the little plaster Paris item I won was only about this tall, as opposed to the big plaster Paris bags. The, um, the other thing that, that I was uh, guest managed a little bit about, and I'll tell you one little scandalous thing uh, when I was, um, that happened here in North Reading. I remember this would have been about 1957. I checked because the book came out. My mother went into the library, and she went over to the desk, and she said, oh, Mrs. Foster, do you have that book set aside for me? And, and, and Mrs. Foster reached under the desk and pulled out a copy of that scandalous novel, Thank you for doing the all of the what she did was scan all of the things from an old calendar that was at um, No, it was the 1950 1953 1953 right. Uh, right. Right. The one without me in the quote. <laughs> yes. And so I really appreciate that. And Maggie, also, you helped out. Where are you, Maggie? You helped out, too. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ben. Thank you, Judy, too. And thank you for being her friend. It's been quite thank a friendship. Thank you for being a friend. friend. See, I knew oh, she was a friend. Write us a song, it. everybody. Get up there and sing it. I don't know what And Tom, thank you. And Lee, thank you for videoing it from NORCAM. We really, really appreciate it. Help yourself to refreshments. Thank you, Gloria, for thank doing the refreshments. Yes, everybody say it. Thank you, Gloria. It's social time here. You're not allowed to leave yet. Stay in talking. And please, as some of you stronger, especially men, if you would like help us put some of the chairs back. Well, so well not yet. Let us sit. No, no, no. It's true. I'm not telling you. I'm hoping you'll stay, honestly.